Okay, we're live right now and we're recording. So whenever you're ready, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Good evening and I'd like to call the regular meeting of Empire Town Council for December 14th, 2020 to order at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Councillor McGee. Here. Councillor Toner. Here. Councillor Burnett. Here. Councillor Grinstead. Here. Councillor Strike. Here. County Councillor Lynch. Here. And Mayor Stack. Here. An adoption of the agenda, please. Be it resolved that the agenda for the regular meeting of council dated Monday, December 14th, 2020 be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Lisa, Lynn. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Any disclosure of pecuniary interests? Seeing none. And do we have any questions from previous council business? Not seeing any hands raised. Okay, thank you. And we have the adoption of the minutes, please. That the minutes of the regular and special meetings of council listed under item 6A and B on the agenda be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Dan and Tom, any comments? All in favor? Carried, thank you. So we have uh, awards and presentations. We have a number of awards tonight. Do you want to do the town award first? Yes. So I've asked, I put Mike here in the meeting. Can we get his video on? Yes, I'm. He's just going to get his video on in just a moment. I see his name, but I don't. Yeah. Oh, he's unmuted. Can you hear me? I yeah. can hear you now, yes. But you can't see me. Not yet. No, we cannot. <laughs> you, know, you, you do that sidebar where it asks it to start camera. Does not allow me to do that here. Just asks me to unmute. Oops. Oh. Oh, <laughs> there we go. There's Mike. Hey, Hi, Mike. Hello, everybody. Good evening, Mike. Thanks for uh, tuning in tonight. Mike, it's my pleasure tonight to uh, present you with the town award. And uh, some may not know, we did actually meet in person in council chambers the other day and physically give you your award. But yes. on behalf of the members of council and the citizens of Empire, it's my pleasure to present this year's town award to Mr. Mike Marcel. Mike has been devoted to the town of Empire and surrounding areas since moving here from St. Catharines. As written in the certificate presented to Mike alongside the award, what makes Empire great is the hardworking, dedicated people willing to give both time and talent to help improve and enhance the quality of life for those living here. Mr. Marcel is well known for his love of our prayer, kind demeanor and willingness to help others and those in need. These characteristics combined with his affiliation to community-minded corporation, Joint Tiger, has placed him in an excellent position to affect positive change in our town. The list of Mike's community involvement is lengthy, but some of the initiatives include the White Pine Festival, Partners in Caring, the Grove Expansion, Teachers Against Poverty, Air Prayer Legion, the Optimus Club, Air Prayer Food Bank, Seniors at Home Program, Humane Society, United Way, and Children's Fire Safety Initiatives, to name a few. It's a little more than a few, Mike. <laughs> your tireless work behind the scenes assisting your fellow citizens reflects the, un the, the essence of what this town award represents. Thank you for your many contributions and continued efforts in support of our community. I'm pleased to present you with that award. Thank you very well, uh, much. It's my honor. Am I supposed to say something? If you would like to. 
I would. Yeah, Thanks, it. Dan. Um, I, I really don't do things to be recognized. I do them because I enjoy doing it and I can do it. Um, and I will continue to do it. Uh, I've been in a lot of towns, a lot of cities, um, but I can say with a lot of pride that Iron Pryor is my home and most likely will remain my home for my family. It's, a, it's an amazing community, amazing people in town, and I just want to continue to help any way and every way that I possibly can. So thank you very much, and I am truly, absolutely honored. Good, thank you. Well deserved, Mike. Okay, and my next uh, task tonight is the pleasure of awarding the Volunteer of the Year Award to Ralph Chown. Is Ralph tuning in tonight? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Let me just give Kayla a minute to get him up. Hi, Ralph. Hi there. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but can you turn your video on or? Uh, I'm just looking where it is. Uh, <clears throat> I don't see anything that says video. Usually down in your left-hand corner. It says mute down in the left-hand corner. And then there's a start video and a stop video, like a little video camera in the uh, bottom, the bottom left, right beside the mute button. If on the, there's, there's the mute button. And let's see what else we've got here. Start video. Uh, there's a select microphone, select speaker, uh, raise hand, <laughs> question and answer and leave over on the right side but there's no video camera. Hmm. Okay, okay. Oh. And I can see every- Oh, hold on a second. What just happened? Where did he go? After he said, I can see everybody, <laughs> he disappeared. <laughs> right okay. around to your work. Yeah. Can, you, can, you, can you see me now? I Good. think we will be able to, yes, yeah, we yeah. can. There we yeah. go. Okay. There we go, Ralph. Perfect. <laughs> Hi, Ralph. Welcome tonight, Ralph. Okay, I see myself. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, as with Mike, we uh, had the pleasure of physically presenting uh, Ralph's award to him the other day in council chambers, but it is my pleasure tonight uh, via Zoom to publicly uh, present Ralph with the uh, Aaron Prayer Volunteer of the Year Award. Volunteers give their name and talents to organizations to help further initiative and make a difference in our community. The town of Ampera is lucky to have many citizens who do just that, give of themselves countless hours to make the community a better place. On an annual basis, the town of Ampera presents the Volunteer of the Year Award to someone who is making a difference in our community, and this year's recipient is Ralph Jowan. As a community volunteer, Ralph consistently steps up and delivers with a positive and engaging attitude. Ralph helped spearhead the Renfrew County Senior Games, creating a vast network of valuable resources and volunteers, which he main maintains today. He currently leads the team that has helped develop and facilitate Renfrew County's 55 plus Invitational Swim Meet, a sanctioned event in the spring, which engages both the community and the county at large. Additionally, Ralph is also an active and respected member of the Masters Swims Canada, Iron Prayer Gray, excuse me, Gray Fish Swim Club, the Iron Prayer Museum, and the Greater Iron Prayer Seniors Council, member responsible for senior sport and development. Ralph effectively drives initiatives such as education, educational, social, and recreational opportunities for seniors with enthusiasm. Ralph is a member of the Iron Prayer Family History Group associated with Aaron Prayer McNabb Rayside Archives. From a volunteer perspective, his goal is to get more seniors to participate in activities, particularly swimming. Ralph is said to be a leader. He is driven, positive, dependable, reliable, and forthright. He approaches tasks with integrity and determination. Ralph, all that you do in our community is appreciated, and I want to congratulate you on being this year's Town of Aaron Prayer Volunteer of the Year. Thank you for your many contributions and continued efforts. Yeah. 
You can. Here's uh, what it looks. Like. I don't know if you. Can, I don't know if you can see that or not. <laughs> but uh, if if I may comment, uh, you know, for the uh, I, I've heard. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, your, your comments, they're quite extensive, but I thought maybe if I could just add a few words so that others might uh, understand uh, at least what I believe was behind the nomination. Uh, as you've mentioned, I've been a member of the uh, Greater Empire Senior Council, and uh, every year this, the uh, Renfrew County Senior Games uh, Association runs uh, summer games uh, of which there are uh, five, uh, 17 different events are held. And uh, these activities uh, included golf and uh, pickleball, lawn bowling uh, as examples, and of, of which were well attended. However, uh, the uh, swimming had uh, failed to draw any uh, uh, participants in the, in, the last, in the last session. And that was of concern to me because uh, uh, swimming uh, is an activity that lends its well so, so well to people with different abilities and capabilities and ages. Um, I had been involved uh, with masters swimming since 1983, uh, and uh, in in May of, of 2019, I I attended the Renfrew County uh, Senior uh, Games Association AGM, which was held at the new Rec Center in Brayside. <clears throat> the topic of swimming was uh, uh, was brought forward, and I again expressed my concern about the part the uh, poor uh, participation. Uh, the problem was acknowledged, and I was asked uh, if I could design uh, a competition that would attract a good number of, uh, uh, of senior swimmers. I said that I could if I was given a blank piece of paper. Uh, I was asked to submit a proposal for approval. Uh, for a swim meet to be, uh, be held in the spring of uh, 2020. <clears throat> uh, I dealt on the, I dwelled on this uh, uh, ch uh, challenge for a few months and then in the fall of 2019, um, um, I came to the con 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 conclusion that if there were to be new rules, they should be based upon those already written by Masters uh, Swimming Ontario. Um, so I, I contacted the president of uh, MSO and explained uh, uh, our intentions uh, and to get, to get uh, permission to uh, adapt uh, uh, their rules uh, for our rules and to use the same numbering system. And the reason for that, if you have volunteer uh, officials come in, they're familiar with, with the numbering system that it would be much easier for them to read. So in December 19, uh, December of 2019, uh, a copy of the uh, proposed rules were presented through Glen Arthur to uh, Renfrew County Senior Games and were approved at the end of December. Um, so that was, uh, uh, that was uh, brought us up to the end of the last year. The next step was to draft a meet format uh, for approval by uh, Senior Games. Uh, which was done and was approved at the end of January uh, 2020. Uh, other people stepped forward. Uh, Barb Kostman, uh, who uh, was involved with the uh, 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 community uh, kids, uh, <clears throat> had a, a, a meet program. It isn't just for, for swimming, it's for any, any uh, athletic uh, uh, meet. And she offered the, uh, us the, the use of that and also the guidance of how it was to be done. Um, so the, uh, so the um, uh, Robert Hughes then at uh, Brittle Printing nicely uh, formatted uh, two uh, booklets uh, for us, a, a rules book for the meat management and one for the uh, competitors. And they were printed up. And so I have an, ex an example of sort of what that looked like. When I look at it, it's backwards. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and then in, so then, uh, um, uh, then in, in February, with the uh, support of Gren, uh, Graham Ivory at uh, Nick Smith, a date was chosen to be May 24th of this year. And a brochure to advertise the meat was printed and, and distributed. Um, the, the meet was called the uh, 
55 plus uh, invitational meet, not a senior games meet because we were not following senior game rules. And so the, um, uh, an, an awards package was uh, worked out with Gilfs, and uh, uh, we had TD Bank uh, were very helpful of establishing a bank account for us, and Giant Tiger uh, stepped up to be a sponsor. And of course, then you know what happened, COVID arrived and they pulled the plug at the pool. So uh, we, that which was a great disappointment, however, uh, all is not lost. The rules, the, re the meet format, the awards design, et cetera, are, are now all sitting on the uh, shelf, ready to go. And we hope that maybe in the spring of, tw of uh, 2022, uh, we will be able to uh, uh, host a, a 55 plus meet here in, in Armprior. So I, I thank very much the uh, greater um, uh, Armpire Seniors Council for their encar uh, encouragement <clears throat> and Glenn Arthur for being the catalyst uh, when working with the uh, uh, Renfrew County Senior Games Association, uh, Graham Ivory at the Nick Smith, uh, and for the recognition that the uh, Town of Armpire Council, uh, which is now a strong incentive to continue. So it's a very impressive glass award. It's beautifully crafted. And if it wasn't so heavy, I'd like to stick it at the top of our Christmas tree. So with that, thank you again. And it's been, it's been fun. Great. Thanks very much, Ralph, again. Okay, we have one uh, retirement that we need to acknowledge tonight as well. Uh, Blaine Carr, is he tuning in tonight? I don't believe he's coming in, but I believe that Kayla has a picture. Oh, good, good. Oh, the mask, guys. Eh? Okay, well, many of you will know Blaine for sure. He uh, has recently retired from our fire department. But uh, tonight, publicly, on behalf of the members of council, the staff, and the residents of the town of Empire. It's my pleasure to offer congratulations to Blaine Kerr on his retirement. Not only is he retiring after 46 years of service with the Iron Prior Fire Department, he has also worked as a staff member at the Town of Iron Prior with the Operations and Recreation Team. It is important to note that Blaine comes from a family of firefighters whose contribution to the community through Iron Prior Fire Department is in excess of 100 years of service. Please accept our sincere appreciation that this remarkable milestone in your life, Blaine, we wish you health, happiness in the years ahead, and best wishes on your new chapter. And again, uh, Blaine was in the council chambers with us the other day to accept his award. So uh, next we have a presentation, and it's a COVID financial update. Jennifer, right? Thank you, Mayor Stack, members of council. I'm just gonna let Caleb put the presentation. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to come back to council one more time before the end of the year to give um, another quick uh, COVID financial update. Uh, I'm just gonna touch highlight on a couple of the changes um, that have happened since my last presentation. So um, Ontario has moved to a new COVID uh, response framework. And in that framework, there's five zones of public health measures. Renfrew County currently is in the green prevent zone, which is, which is good. Um, and of course, um, with the Town of Iron Prior, we're continuing to follow our business continuity plans and we've ensured that we're aligning all of those with the provincial framework and with all the Renfrew County, health, uh, Renfrew County District Health Unit guidance and directives. Our, our goal always here in the COVID time is to provide effective service delivery in the safest manner that we can to residents. So to touch briefly on facilities and services, uh, we haven't had too much uh, change. The majority of town facilities and services are still open um, and available to residents. Uh, we still have the exception of civil marriage ceremonies um, and council meetings, of course, just like tonight, continue to follow an electronic format uh, for the remainder of 2020 uh, with the advisory committee meetings on hold. However, I know the town clerk has a report later on in the agenda uh, to deal with that as well. Uh, jumping over to recreation facilities, um, as reported in my last one, 
based on a Ramper County District Health Unit Directive. Um, the Nick Smith Center is still currently not accepting rental requests from City of Ottawa team. And that's because if you go um, back to that, well, our, while um, Renfrew County is in that green, uh, the green zone, um, we're not accepting uh, rentals from other health units that are in higher levels, whether it be you know a red or an orange. Um, certain hockey levels, however, were cleared for de developmental scrimmages, including the Empire Packers against teams in Renfrew County and Carlton Place, who are also in a green prevent status. Um, and as part of that, they're attempting uh, to try some limited spectators allowed on a trial basis. When we took a look at some year-end projections, it's uh, December 14th, we're getting pretty close to, to that year end. Um, the numbers that I've included on the PowerPoints uh, tonight, they do um, reflect all the way to the end of November 30th, 2020 for our revenues expenses. And once again, I would just throw a few reminders on there that I do use a level of assumption and estimation involved in calculating the numbers. So when we look at our COVID uh, impact projections, um, when we're looking at just those levy cost centers, uh, right now, what we're projecting towards the end of uh, the year, we see that our reduced revenues are being more than offset by the cost containment measures, which is a, a good news story. So we do uh, project that there will be a year end surplus for levy cost centers. However, on the flip side for water wastewater and for waste management, uh, we're still seeing those reduced revenues um, that will probably result in uh, a year end deficits in those two areas. However, we will be applying that safe restart agreement to be able to offset both the wastewater and what we're projecting under the waste management for the end of year projections. So to show what that looks like on the next slide, um, you can see that we're projecting um, a surplus coming through in the levy cost centers. And then you can see under water wastewater, you can see we're projecting that 195, um, 710 of um, a, a deficit and about 30,000 under the waste management. However, if we take our total safe restart agreement grant, which is 256,400, we take away those shortfalls from water, wastewater and our waste management. And we are anticipating that we will be carrying forward a small amount of that safe restart agreement forward into the 2021 um, uh, budget year. So under that safe restart agreement, those emergency fundings, um, it does say that you can carry any sort of balance forward in a reserve in order to support any sort of uh, 2021 uh, COVID pressures. Uh, we don't anticipate carrying very much, but looks like it'll probably be a small amount. And with that, I'd open it up to council for any questions. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Any questions from anyone? Oh, well, you're getting off easy tonight. Everybody's mm -hmm. pleased. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. You're welcome. So next we have a public meeting. Okay. The council moved into a public meeting regarding an application for zoning bylaw amendment for the property known as 37 to 39 Cranston Street in Armprior. Mover and seconder, please. Lisa and Lynn, who's addressing this problem, I assume. Well, yeah, I will, uh, sir. We do have um, our new planner who started with the municipality today, Megan Rockwald. I, I welcome her to the team. And um, if you get a chance, please stop in and say hello. Um, she was uh, a welcome sight this morning for me. Is she tuning in? There we go. Uh, so the zoning bylaw amendment, um, I'm gonna change that to a second that we're dealing with tonight uh, is number 40 of 20, and it's related to the properties at 3739 Cranston Street. Uh, as this is a public meeting, a statutory public meeting, I just remind everyone when you're addressing the chair, please give your name and address. If you wanna be notified of further proceedings concerning the application, please provide your name and address to the clerk of the municipality and be advised that the local appeal planning appeal tribunal will dismiss an appeal of an application if the appellant has not provided counsel with either an oral submission at this meeting or a written submission before the amendment is adopted. We've received nothing uh, to date on this application. As I said, we're dealing with a property uh, now municipally known as 3739 Cranston Street, uh, shown here on the key plan as uh, number zero Cranston. This was before a uh, municipal addressing was given, but as you can see, this lot formed part of a, an original plan of subdivision that included Cranston, Gardner, and um, Smolkin Streets. Uh, <coughs> and has now been extended into the new uh, Campanelli subdivision to the um, west northwest of the site. The uh, property is currently designated in our official plan as part of our established residential area. So that applies to any area that was established and completed development more or less 
um, at least five years before council adopted our official plan, which the Smolkin Cranston uh, area certainly, certainly was. The zoning bylaw recognizes the property as an R1 zone, which is our new um, residential zoning in an established residential area for a uh, very low density development. So any, uh, in the types of dwellings that would normally be permitted are singles or semi-detached dwellings. The minimum frontage in our zoning bylaw in the R1 for a semi-detached is 16 meters. And the minimum side yard setback is 1.5. Um, so I'll go ahead, Kayla, to the next slide, please. So to show you what this development looks like on the ground is, um, as you can see, number 37 and 39, fronting on Cranston Street, um, each lot, uh, each part, half of the semi-detached, um, taking up half the lot with uh, frontage for each of those individual units at 10 meters or more. Because our zoning bylaw in the R1, as I said, only recognizes a frontage of 16 meters for a semi-detached, it doesn't recognize for each lot individually. Uh, and so the applicant has applied to um, amend the zoning slightly. Okay, Kayla. Um, to show, um, to establish a minimum frontage for each of the semi-detaches on their own lot at a minimum frontage of 10 meters, which both these units will, will uh, achieve. And also to establish a minimum uh, zero interior, zero meter interior side yard for one side of the semi-detached each on their own lot. So that recognizes the, um, the joint lot line between the two existing, um, the two units. So in conclusion, staff reviewed the intent of the zoning bylaw in a staff report to council on November 9th and uh, uh, recommended holding this public meeting for any uh, comments from the public prior to uh, considering an adoption of, uh, of an amendment to our zoning bylaw at the next council meeting. And that's it if uh, anybody has any questions or any members of the public. No questions. I'm not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Mayor. I have people here, but no hands are raised. Okay, so there's no, no one in from the public. Uh, council, have any comments or questions they wanna? No? Okay, then we need an all in favor, please. Carried, thank you. Yeah, so the council resume, sorry, 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 Mr. Mayor, had the council resume to the regular meeting of council? Yeah, sorry. Return to regular meeting, mover and seconder for that, please. Ted and Dan, you all in favor? Carried, thanks. So we have no matters uh, tabled or deferred. Uh, it's staff reports and the first one is the fairground subdivision. The council adopted bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to enter into a subdivision agreement with Julietta Holdings Inc. for the fairground subdivision with the final form and content of the agreement being the satisfaction of the CAO in consultation with the town solicitor and that council approve the use of the names Morrell Court, Ernie Godden Way and Mac Beatty Drive for the bank of street names for the streets one, two and three on the proposed plan of subdivision. Move and seconder, please. Chris, Lisa. I will uh, speak to it briefly, Mayor Stock, if I may. Um, so as council is aware, we've been dealing with uh, this proposed subdivision at the former fairgrounds for several years now. The owner um, had applied for a plan of subdivision. Draft conditions were issued by the County of Renfrew in uh, November of 2018 and revised in May of 2019. Um, town staff and our engineering consultants have reviewed uh, the engineering aspects of this development. And um, there is a list of reports and plans uh, attached to my staff report for council's consideration that were approved as part of the development. Um, we said that uh, the developer also received their Ministry of uh, Environment Com Compliance approvals for the development and has cleared uh, many draft conditions. One of the draft conditions is that the owner enters into a subdivision agreement uh, to satisfy all the terms and conditions and obligations, financial and otherwise, of the town at their expense uh, to, to develop these lands as per those plans and reports. Uh, so so moving forward, staff used our, our standard form of subdivision agreement to prepare a draft agreement for the developer to enter into. And by entering into it, uh, will thereby fulfill uh, draft condition of, uh, of the subdivision being 2D. 2X is a draft condition that requires all street names to be uh, named in accordance with our street naming policy. And so uh, we went to our street name bank and pulled the three names that are listed in the resolution for the developer's use. Um, so 
I, I might remind council that we did do a pre-servicing agreement uh, back in February of this year for this developer to go ahead and put the services underground for this development and get, get the site ready for um, construction of homes, uh, which happened basically since February of this year. They've been out there on site doing quite a bit of work as, as you all know. Um, and these agreements um, just allow the developer to sort of um, get a head start on their construction season. The uh, developer has also requested conditional building permits be issued for the construction of dwellings. And that has now uh, taken place as the developer has agreed to the subdivision agreement. We have all the security and insurance requirements met and um, full permits and occupancy won't uh, uh, happen until the subdivision agree uh, and, and agreement are registered on title. So. The signing of the subdivision agreement is another step in the draft condition approval process on their way to uh, registering this plan of subdivision to be able to sell houses to new residents. Uh, so we're confident that the, uh, the agreement is our standard and um, worthy of council's uh, uh, attention and the developer is um, in concurrence with the agreement. And I think that's, that's about it. Any uh, comments or questions from council? No? Okay. Then in all in favor, please. It's carried. Thank you. The next is Fourth Avenue. Council received a re receive a revised zoning amendment application, ZBLA 519, for the property known as Part 1 on Plan 49R8580, Part Lot 3, Concession C, Fourth Avenue. To change the zoning designation from employment holding four to residential four exception. And further that pursuant to section 3412 of the Planning Act that council hold a public meeting on January 25th, 2020 regarding the proposed zoning amendment to allow for public review and comment. Okay, move and seconder, please. Lynn and Chris, I guess Robin, you're gonna take this one too. Yes, yes, thank you, sir. Uh, council will remember uh, this application um, because we did deal with it earlier this year. Um, the original application received included both an official plan amendment that rezoned the lands at the corner of uh, 4th Avenue and uh, McNabb Street from uh, an employment or what we call employment, which is our industrial type zone designation to a residential designation to allow them to be developed as um, uh, for multi-unit residential apartments. The official plan amendment was approved by council. It was forwarded to the County of Renfrew and the County of Renfrew has given their approval of it. So the official plan uh, amendment has been adopted and is in full force and effect, meaning that the, the underlying policy for these lands is now residential. You will recall at the public meeting, we did deal with a potential rezoning uh, of the site at the same time to go again from the industrial designation to a residential designation to allow for apartments to be built on the land. However, at that time, the developer indicated that they might um, have some changes to the concept plan that they brought forward and may need different um, exceptions to the R4 zone as they were originally proposing. So we held off bringing forward a bylaw for council's consideration at that time. We have received a revised, um, a revised application or revisions to the application that would um, recognize um, some four-story apartment buildings and two six-story buildings to be used uh, for retirement use. And so uh, as a result of that, we recognize there were enough changes to the application that we should um, bring the changes forward to the public for further consideration before council um, considers a zoning bylaw amendment for the property. Um, there is a, um, some information that we can share with the public as far as the concept plan goes and the dimensions of of the lot and uh, the units that are being built um, as part of the notice for the public meeting, but we're requesting that council consider holding another public meeting at this time uh, in early January to uh, to look at the exceptions that they're proposing and to get public feedback on the same. So um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any questions or comments, Penny? Lisa? Uh, just one question on it, Robin. It it didn't seem terribly clear when I was looking at it. It mentions that they will meet the parking requirement, but then uh, there's another spot in the document where it mentions that there are only 57 spaces. And certainly in looking at the revised document, it, it doesn't look like there's an abundance of parking. Um, are you able to speak to that at all? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think the original plan that showed the 57 um, looked at uh, the requirements uh, for residential apartments. The retirement home designation will require a little bit more parking because with a retirement home, you have um, 
ancillary uses to, uh, to provide services to the residents, be it um, a restaurant, like a, a dining facility, that kind of thing. Uh, so there is a bit more required than a standard apartment building would have. And I think when they did the concept plan, they maybe didn't account for that parking. However, they are well aware that there would be a requirement for additional parking as a result of that. And again, this is a concept plan. So at the end of the day, when they um, bring forward a site plan to actually develop the site, they will have to be able to show that they can meet our parking requirements and they feel confident that they can do that. May mean uh, some, some reduced footprints or, or whatever, but um, that will be a, a requirement for them to, uh, to be able to, to um, receive site plan approval and building permit. Okay, anyone else? Ed? Yeah, yeah Robin. This may be a little premature, but um, I'm just wondering what they're going to do for snow storage. Is it pretty tight the way it is uh, now? That, yeah, I understand the question is a little a little premature because we will absolutely look at that as part of the site plan. Uh, we always require that they um, that a developer is able to show where storage can accommodate be accommodated on site. And usually, for a situation like this where you have a, a an apartment, a, you know, a leased uh, building like this when we enter into the site plan agreement, there'll be a requirement for the owner to show us that they, um, that they will have uh, snow removal operations uh, contracted for the site. That's premature, I just wanted to throw it out there. Yeah, it's a good one, Ted. Yeah. Anybody else? No, okay, all in favor then, please? Yes, Carried, thank you. So next one is municipal grants, Hamper Cadets. Oh, sorry, grant application first. So the council directs staff to make an application to the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, ICIP, COVID-19 Resilience Infrastructure Stream for Playground and Pathway Infrastructure while demonstrating good asset management practices for Legion Park and Caruso Park. And the council directs staff to make an application for the inclusive community grants for improving wayfindings, accessibility and public safety um, while demonstrating good asset management practices for the signage. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Lynn, Chris. Okay, just one Lynn. second. Sorry? Just one second, I'm just putting Grant Yeah, in. I thought I was waiting for you, Kayla. It looked like you were staring at the screen. It will work, maybe? Hold on, he's coming. There we go. Yep. Yo. Hey, Graham. Thank you, uh, members of council. So I'd just like to uh, kind of briefly go over a bit of background on both of these grant opportunities. So first off is the uh, Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, ICIP. Uh, this is a federal grant. Um, that is providing 11.8 million or sorry, 11.8 billion dollars in federal infrastructure uh, fundings to cost share projects under four streams uh, that include public transit, uh, green infrastructure, community culture and recreation, along with rural and northern communities. So those are the four streams. Uh, we would be obviously applying under the community culture and recreation stream um, that also kind of captures uh, provincial support. So the government, uh, the federal government covers 80%, uh, while the provincial cover, uh, government uh, covers uh, the balance of 20%. So this is 100% coverage. Uh, there is no cost uh, whatsoever to, uh, to the municipality uh, for this grant opportunity. Uh, each municipality uh, does receive a minimum allocation, so you're eligible to receive uh, a minimum amount uh, if your grant is successful. So um, all municipalities are allocated a minimum of $100,000 uh, with increases based um, on a couple of different in indicators, um, which has resulted in an allocation for the town of Empire of $190,912. Uh, so a bit of background information on the other grant opportunity, the inclusive uh, community grant. This is through the uh, provincial government, through the Ministry for Seniors uh, and Accessibility. And this opportunity uh, really ties into a lot of what uh, would have gone through in the development of the Age-Friendly Community Plan. Um, so it kind of looks at those, um, those eight domains of community life that were identified by the World Health Organization that are also captured um, in our age-friendly community plan. So that includes 
outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, housing, uh, respect and inclusion, social participation, civic participation and employment, communication and information and community support and health services. And this particular application uh, for ours really touches on that communication and, and information piece. Um, so much like the, uh, the previous grant, this one is 100% covered by the province um, up to a maximum of $60,000 per uh, successful applicant. So I'll kind of jump into what the, uh, the proposed uh, applications include. Uh, so obviously outdoor play um, is a cornerstone element of, of recreation, but I think COVID-19 has certainly put an emphasis on that over the, uh, over the last nine months. Um, so the town's aim now is to use this grant opportunity to, to further advance outdoor play opportunities uh, in, our, in our community. And those two uh, projects would be featured at Legion Park and Caruso Street Park. So as we were uh, all part of uh, the announcement last week at Legion Park with the unveiling of the Sullivan Rink of Dreams, um, that uh, fantastic uh, gift to the town um, is now, I think, a, a great asset in that part of our community and at that park. And now I think that you know we, we aim to build on, on what we can do at that particular location and provide lots more play opportunities for everyone that would visit that park. And we know with a, um, a facility like the Rink of Dreams at Legion Park, that there's certainly gonna be a lot more attention into that area, not just in the winter time when there's ice uh, down on the slab, but throughout the summer as well, when we can have lots of, uh, uh, of community programming taking place there. Uh, so the two aspects of, of what we're contemplating at, at Legion Park is the installation of a play structure um, that will also include accessible play features um, and the structure itself would be installed on a rubber base. So that not only improves the safety of play uh, for people on the structure, but more importantly, it supports the accessibility of that play structure for everyone to access. Uh, and the second element of the project um, is to ensure that Legion Park itself in its entirety um, is accessible. Uh, and in doing so through asphalt, uh, a network of asphalt pathways that would uh, kind of connect Edy Street and Wilford Crest and into the park, tying into the, the new playground uh, structure feature, uh, as well as the Rink of Dreams. The second element uh, to this grant application um, is for Crusoe Street Park. Uh, in the long range capital forecast, um, it was due for life cycle replacement in 2022. Um, so felt that this would be an opportunity to revitalize a, a popular neighborhood park um, a little bit earlier than what we would have budgeted for and an item that was coming up in our, in our long range budget. So um, a good opportunity to cover that cost through, through this grant opportunity. Um, and while it wouldn't have a, a, rubber, a rubber base similar to, to what we're looking to do at Legion Park, it would have that um, engineered wood fiber mulch or EWF that certainly also meets um, accessibility guidelines for, for that new feature and, and the play structure would kind of better tie into the, the wooded landscape that uh, that kind of Crusoe Park um, is kind of backdropped against. Um, switching gears to the inclusive community grant. So uh, I think we've talked quite a bit about the Nick Smith Center over the last couple of years in terms of the, the aging infrastructure here and the plans that we put in place through our, our Nick Smith Center working group to, to identify some of those things um, and starting to, to kind of chip away at, at, at what those are. Um, and then looking at what our age-friendly community plan and our multi-year accessibility plan identify in terms of improvements to, to any town facility. Uh, the project that we are looking into at the Nick Smith Center um, is to improve accessibility and public safety through uh, the following four measures. A wayfinding strategy, uh, an, um, uh, an emergency plan, installation of new signage uh, that ties into that wayfinding strategy and emergency plan, and a public education campaign. So again, as I mentioned, that kind of ties into that multi-year accessibility plan um, that has kind of been a, a guiding document for, for application uh, for this grant. Um, both of these grants are due um, for submission a, a week from today on the 21st of December, 
with the caveat of the, the ICIP grant uh, being that if there's more than one project, which there is by definition with us looking at two play structure features, um, the application deadline is then extended to January 7th of 2021. Uh, both are expected to have uh, approvals through in, in uh, early 2021, February for the uh, Inclusive Community Grant, uh, the spring of 2021 for the ISIP grant. Uh, for the ISIP grant, projects must be uh, commenced no later than uh, the end of September of 2021 and must be completed by the end of 2021. So um, a lot of big projects to, to take on through this grant and uh, a pretty quick timeline to, to address everything in there. Uh, and the Inclusive Community Grant uh, provides a deadline of March 31st, 2022. So lots of time to, to, uh, to undergo this project at the Nick Smith Centre. Uh, so I do want to also just outline some of the, um, the financial considerations as, as part of this grant application. So uh, outlined in your report, you would have seen uh, kind of a breakdown of the ICIP grant. Uh, for Legion Park. So uh, the design uh, equipment and installation of the structure and that uh, that rubber base at $115,000. Uh, the, the pathway network um, comprising of asphalt at $19,800 with a total of $134,800 at Legion Park. And the total cost of the design equipment and installation at Caruso Park coming in at $56,000, uh, bringing out the total estimated cost to $190,800. And again, the maximum amount we can apply for is $190,912. On the inclusive community grant side, uh, the breakdown of the $60,000 um, that we will be applying for uh, will be $30,000 for the, the strategy and plan. Again, wayfinding emergency and an updated fire plan. Signage and installation at $25,000. And that would include both uh, the interior and exterior of the Nick Smith Center, and then a public awareness campaign at $5,000, and again, totaling $60,000, and 100% of that uh, is covered by uh, the provincial government. So going through this, there have been uh, meetings with a, uh, with a playground design company who have provided uh, some great guidance and uh, financial information to, to make an accurate uh, application for this grant along with a consultant uh, with a background in public safety and events to, uh, to look at the wayfinding and emergency plan strategy for uh, the Nick Smith Center. Be happy to take any questions. Hey, uh, thanks, Graham. I mean, a couple of comments. Just one is that I'm glad to see us going to Caruso Park. It could use some attention and hasn't had a lot over the years, you know, and then uh, just be sure at Legion Park to leave uh, room for that splash pad, okay? Yeah. Yeah, because all this money that you're not going to spend two years from now may, may fit into that. Any other comments? <clears throat> Ted? Yeah. Graham, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Graham, the, the numbers I'm looking at uh, include taxes, I presume? Uh, based on the estimates provided, yes. Everything that um, was kind of put in there included installation, taxes, labor, all that stuff. Thank you. Tom? Um, just a question with regards to Caruso Street. Will they be putting a rink in there again, uh, as in the past? I've had questions about that. Yeah, so uh, for the, the outdoor rinks this year, obviously uh, the Sullivan Rink of Dreams is a, a new task for us. So that is going to be kind of priority number one. We expect to start building ice there tomorrow. Uh, the boards that we purchased um, through construction of the men's shed last year have been installed um, at, um, at Olympia. Uh, last week, I believe. So we'll start kind of flooding there sometime into this week and next week. And for Caruso Park, it is going to be a puddle rink for this year. Uh, so there won't be boards up there, but there will be a rink that will be set up at Caruso Park. Thank you. Okay. Anything up? Chris? Hi, Graham. Uh, these are both really good, um, really good plans. The one thing I'd like to add, please, is... Um, with the design of the children's play structures, okay, it would be really fantastic if we could somehow um, kind of engage the youth of this town to maybe be a part in the development of um, like the playground or at least have some kind of input. 
I know that I'm sure that the uh, the playground planners uh, that you contacted, you know, they I'm sure they have lots of studies and they've probably uh, polled some kids across the country, but it would be really nice that if we can somehow, uh, if we can engage our youth into maybe, uh, you know, planning and figuring out what they would like to see in their playgrounds that they will be using. I think that would be really helpful. And then, you know, maybe as they grow older, you know, it, it, like it will make them, be, you know, be better citizens because they've actually been a part of something and they can tell their kids, well, I'm sure it would be long gone by the time they have kids, but um, just something that they can tell their friends that, you know what, we were a part of this. And I, and I think if there's somehow that we can do that, uh, I, that would really be fantastic. Good point. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thanks, Graham. All in favor then, please? Carried. Thank you. So the next one is the municipal grant uh, for Empire Cadets. Council waived fifty percent of the user fees and charges for the two three six zero Royal Canadian Army Cadets municipal grant request for the use of the Nick Smith Center Community Hall on Thursday evenings from six p.m. to nine p.m. for seven week and for seven weekend rentals for the period of January seventh, twenty twenty one to June twenty fourth, twenty twenty one at a value of $2,725 and further that the 2360 Royal Canadian Army Cadets be advised that it is mandatory to carry sufficient liability insurance and have the town of Farm Park added as an additional insured. Move and seconder, please. Chris and Lynn. Comments? I'm going to come up here. Dan? I'm going to be. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't. If you, if that's okay, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, I'm going to just go through a quick PowerPoint presentation with Graham, and then. Um, if yeah, I'm sorry, I knew that. I just forgot about you needing the time. <laughs> no worries. Perfect. Okay, so we're just going to go through a uh, quick background information on this application submitted by the Royal Canadian Army Cadets. So to provide a little bit of background, in 2019, the Town of Armpire adopted an updated municipal grants policy within, with the update being made in November of 2020. The new policy was enacted to provide a comprehensive process for receiving, processing, and handling varying requests that are received. In order to qualify for municipal grant funding, applicants are required to meet various qualification criteria, including the demonstration of financial need. So council has waived the rental fees for the Nick Smith Center Community Hall for the cadets for a number of years for their weekly training as well as special training events for this youth program. An in-kind partnership request has been submitted by the cadets for the use of the Nick Smith Center Community Hall for 75 hours of rental time and seven full day weekend rentals. The cadets have requested 100% of the fees to be waived for the use of the Nick Smith Center Community Hall as outlined for the time period of January 7th, 2021 to June 24th, 2021. This would be equivalent to a total cost of $5,450. And the request was evaluated based on the eligibility criteria in the municipal grants policy and was found to be in compliance other than the ability to demonstrate financial the application submitted by the cadets indicated they have the following funds available to them in 2021. They have an operating bank account of $16,445 and change, a savings account balance of over $6,000, a GIC account balance of $10,000. It was noted that the surplus of funds available in the operating account was due to the cancellation of programs and activities because of COVID-19. Staff completed a financial review looking at the operating bank account and the ability of the debt of the cadets to pay all or part of the rental request, uh, looking at the account balance and projected revenues and expenses in 2021, and the two components of the cadets revenue was noted as uncertain due to COVID-19 and these potential losses were also taken into consideration. As there is some uncertainty of revenue for 2021, the following table that I'm going to show will show a worst case scenario as if no municipal grant leaving the cadets with a negative operating balance at the end of 2021, which would force the use of their savings, as well as a best case scenario with a full 100% municipal grant leaving the cadets with a projected end of 2021 with a positive operating balance of over $10,000, almost 11, not including the balances in their savings and their GIC. 
So if you look at the table here, this table was included in the report. Um, this shows the operating uh, budget with you're looking at your the end balance. Um, and then it also shows without their total, without either their grocery or their legion funding, which is their ones that were uncertain at this time. And then the bottom of the table shows um, the difference in percentages if we were to give them 25%, 50%, 75%, or 100% of the grant funding and what would be left um, in their operating account. And it's highlighted in yellow that staff's recommendation at 50%. So looking at the cadets financial information, the worst case scenario demonstrates financial need. However, the best case scenario does not and staff are recommending a 50% uh, municipal grant for the 2021 request to address the unpredictability that the cadets may or may not receive their usual expected revenue. This will leave the cadets with a closing balance in their operating bank account of over $2,000 after all expenses are expected in the 2021 year as well as their full savings account and GIC account balances as noted. I'm going to turn it over to Graham to talk a little bit about some comparisons. So we just wanted to outline some of the other youth programming um, that have applied for grants or that operate here at the Nick Smith Center. So Special Olympics is a youth program that also received uh, municipal grant support for programming. Uh, Special Olympics like the cadets uh, do not charge uh, their participants. Uh, Special Olympics operate on a break-even budget, uh, leaving little to no money left in their account after revenue and expenses. Uh, the cadets op are operating with a surplus of operating funds and savings, as well as the GIC that Kayla outlined in, in her report. So there are several other youth organizations that do use the Nick Smith Center. Uh, they do charge fees for their programs and pay fees for the use of our facility. Uh, this includes Armpire Minor Hockey Association, Armpire McNabb Ringette Association, Armpire Figure Skating Club, the Armpire Bluefish Swim Club, and the Armpire Highlanders. Uh, so it's important that uh, we treat all organizations equitably. This year the cadets are operating with a surplus and thus from the financial analysis completed, staff feels that the cadets have the ability to fund a portion of the user fees associated with their request. So in conclusion, in previous years, the cadets may have shown a greater financial need, thus warranting the request of full waiving of fees. Um, may, and this may also be the case for future years. Um, we do do this process on an annual basis. So organizations have to submit, um, as per the updated municipal grants policy applications on an annual basis to be considered. So this year, as the cadets are running with a positive surplus, the financial need is less and they have the ability in staff's opinion to fund a portion of the rental cost. Um, this municipal grant request falls under the in-kind partnership support stream where support is provided through waiving of user fees and charges. And there is a potential for lost opportunity of revenue as other revenue generating programs could be using the community hall during this time requested. Staff do not consider this a barrier for approving the space for the cadets at this time. Uh, council could choose to support the cadets request for 100% of the in-kind partnership support uh, valued at $5,450, or you could choose to support the cadets request at a different percentage as determined by council. And then council could also choose not to support the municipal grant request. Uh, staff doesn't recommend this as this program is a benefit and offered at no cost to the youth in our community. So some next steps. Council's decision on the municipal grant application as presented this evening, and then notification will be provided to the cadets on the decision made this evening. And with that, Graham and I will be happy to take any questions. Hey, I think uh, <clears throat> we're open for questions. And Dan, you were up first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was going to talk a little bit about the option number one to do the 100% funding. I realize they have money in the bank as of today. As compared to the other comparators, the, they go out and uh, support uh, the Legion in the way of the poppy campaign and they sell their apples and they do other stuff in the way of helping seniors. With the Legion the way it is, and everyone knows we had a fundraising for the Legion. There are no, they used to do the serving in order to get monies, there's no more serving. Um, 
the exercise in Petawawa that they go for the two weeks that costs a small fortune and that was canceled last year. So that's where the money would have come from. I'm assuming with if we all get our needles, all good stuff, there could be another camp this year and obviously it'd be more money taken. So the worst case scenario, as I read, it was $2,000. Um, I don't see a problem with them having the, the $5,000 in, in the reserves for, for whatever reason, at least they've got a reserve. And it's not a, to me, it's not a cash where I'm giving you cash, they're getting it in lieu of. So there could be Thursdays that we're going to have an election or there's going to be something that they're going to lose that day. So in, in fact, we're saving the money that way. So I'm suggesting or recommending that uh, uh, we consider being the 100%. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Lisa was next. Thank you. Um... I, I was initially leaning towards the 50%, but Dan does make some compelling arguments. I think, um, I'm just reading on the cadets here now, I didn't realize their, their, their age group um, is from 12 to 18 year olds, which I think we can all acknowledge is a, an, it's a group we wanna keep engaged. We've all heard about how important it is to have youth engaged in our community and how people feel that there are some services that are lacking in this, it, everything I know about the cadets, I can't pretend that I'm I'm any expert by any stretch, but you know it's very positive, positive experience for the kids. Um, so I, I I would support the hundred percent ask for the same reason that Dan has just explained, and uh, I think it's a great organization. Okay, Lynn is next. Okay, so I'm also going to suggest that we follow through with 100%. I, I respect and thank staff for their, you know, uh, shoring it up as, as our grant policy, but because it's a COVID year, I think that every other year they scramble. As a mom of two kids that were in cadets, um, I very much appreciate it all that they got from the program for the many years that they were in the program. They weren't in the Army Cadets, they were in the Air Cadets, but it's the same, same type of program, free. They give all the uniforms, all of the events that they go to, they take them on uh, survival weekends and, and everything. There is a lot of expense that they go through. And I'm sure that soon as the uh, restrictions are lifted, they're going to be so excited to get those kids back and active. And I would assume that they're probably going to do more for them in that first year of, of no restrictions than they have in previous years. So I'd like to see them have the revenue to be able to plan ahead and do those things. Anyone else? Tom? Yeah. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the 100%. I just wonder if, in fact, there was a weekend that they had booked if the uh, uh, town would have the opportunity to rent it to another group, if uh, that could be just transferred to another date so that we could get revenue from some of those uh, weekend dates that they're talking about. I'll leave that response to Graham. Is that a possibility, Graham? Yeah, like there, there's typically some planning into the weekend events that they do. Um, so I think anything that would be a few months out, there's some flexibility. But say, for example, if they nail down that particular weekend that they want to do something in January, um, yeah, I, I think we would have to to remain committed to the time that they that they want to use it for. Okay. Dan, again, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one of those dates would be the graduation parade that's pretty well locked in stone because they bring all the commanding officers from across uh, Ontario to be there to, to watch these kids uh, graduate. So that, that day would be in stone. Okay, anybody else for comment? I, uh, given it some thought too, I'm just a little reluctant, I guess, to penalize sort of any organization because of a COVID year. Uh, we don't know what 2021 is gonna be. It doesn't look like it's gonna be full tilt again either. So there is a caution there. I don't have a problem supporting 100% this year with the qualifier that if these revenues increase because of a second year, then it may not be a 50%, it may be 100%, you know, depending on, there's some significant numbers there and I know they have significant expenses when they're fully operating. But if they have two years in a row where they're not at this year, they didn't do anything. Next year might be half of their half of their year or maybe less. And I think we need to look real closely at their finances next year. And it could be a different 
a different scenario for them. So we need, we need uh, to someone to move one of these options, Lynn. So it's, okay, Lynn, are you moving to? I would move to, uh, to amend it to 100%. Okay, so we would be, that council would amend the resolution to change the wording of line one, paragraph one, that council waive 100% of the user fees and charges for the 2360 Royal Canadian Army Cadets. Thank you. Okay, and seconder. Okay, I think Dan wanted to second it, eh, Dan? Yes, Did please. Or is that, yes, yeah. Okay, was that, I saw another hand, was that Lynn or, or Lynn, Lisa? Lynn. Did you? No, okay. Uh, okay, so we have a mover and a seconder for it, but again, like, I think there needs to be a note attached to the qualifier that next year could, will be under a little more stringent review. Okay, any further comments? Okay, then all in favor? Carried, thank you. And then Mr. Mayor, I just also need a mover and seconder for the resolution carried as amended for that. Oh, sorry. It's Lynn and Dan. Okay. All Perfect. in favor? Carried. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. And the accessibility status update, please. The council approved the Town of Rampart 2020 accessibility plan status report attached to this and that the Town of Rampart 2020 accessibility plan status report be posted on the town website. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Chris, Lisa, Caleb. Yeah, just give me one second. I'm going to put up a presentation. Perfect. So just to give a little bit of a report on this year's 2020 annual status report on our multi-year accessibility plan. So to provide a little bit of background, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act was first introduced in 2005. And the AODA has been implemented through a series of three standards, the Accessible Customer Service Standard, Integrated Accessibility Standards Regulation, and Design of Public Spaces Standard. The IASR was implemented by the province in 2011 and this regulation required the town to implement a multi-year accessibility plan in 2013 to document how the town plans to modify service delivery, programming, workplace processes, etc. The town of Rampart approved its most recent 2018-2023 multi-year accessibility plan in 2018. In accordance with the ISR and to meet the legislative requirements of the AODA, the Town of Rampart is to prepare an annual status report on this plan detailing what items have been addressed and which items of the plan still need to be completed. The 2020 status report has been prepared and attached to the report this evening. And the Town of Rampart has met all of its legislative requirements and continues to monitor areas that require ongoing attention. And as of January 1st, 2021, the Town of Armpire as a designated public sector organization must have all internet websites and web content conform to the WCAG 2.0 level AA. So the current website that we have does conform to the standard and then there is also a new website that will be launched in May of 2021. Staff will continue to monitor the web content that is on our current website as well as what web content will be posted on the new website and update it for accessibility as required. As a note, we also have training uh, scheduled for later in this month uh, for creating of accessible documents um, so that we can make sure that going forward, we can have our documents created accessibly um, all the time when they're being posted for the public. So further goals that are noted in our multi-year accessibility plan um, that, also, that they identify areas of the further goals which go above and beyond the requirements of the legislation. So this list was established in consultation with the Accessibility Advisory Committee when developing the updated multi-year accessibility plan. So one further goal included in the multi-year plan was noted as making all washrooms accessible at the Nick Smith Center. So upon further review of the Nick Smith Center community hall specifically when looking at those washrooms, staff determined it would be very challenging to make this um, or those washrooms fully accessible. So staff have expanded this further goal to include the installation of a new standalone accessible washroom um, when or if budget or grant funding uh, becomes available. So that's been added um, this year to clarify the wording in our multi-year plan. So the further achievements, uh, if you're looking at this year, overall goals, we looked at accessible sign guidelines policy that was, um, that was created um, and put in place in 2020. 
And we also heard Graham's application for grant to design and replace wayfinding signage at the Nick Smith Center. That's going to be submitted this year as well, the grant. <laughs> at the Armpire Library, magnetic door openers were installed on meeting room doors to keep doors open for accessibility and also act in a fire safe manner. And then the Robert Simpson Park, uh, there was a, a note that the, to have accessible swings installed at Robert Simpson Park. So as we have not um, installed accessible swings at Robert Simpson Park, because we would be looking at that park as a whole through the waterfront master plan, it is important to note that as of this year, six accessible swings are available at Atkinson, Caruso, Legion, McLean Avenue, Optimus, and Village Creek Park. So looking at financial considerations, there is no cost associated with the approval of the annual accessibility status report. However, necessary training and implementation of various items included will continue to incur some cost to the municipality. The cost of implementing any maintenance infrastructure items being actioned under the further goals um, section. Um, these items are also completed under departmental operating budget funds, either as a capital item or through grant funding. So in conclusion, this report is being provided to council for their information and council is asked to approve the 2020 accessibility status report as attached and direct staff to post the status report on the town's website for public review and comment. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Okay, do we have any, any questions or comments? None? Okay. okay. Thanks, Kayla. We need an all in favor then, please. Thank you. Next, we have the extension of electronic meetings. That report 2012-14, extension of ex electronic participation at council committee and board meetings be received for, for, for information and that council meetings and the regular advisory committee meetings in accordance with the council calendar resume electronically for a period of six months or until such a time that it is safe to resume to in-person meetings in council chambers and that council amend bylaw 692-219 to provide electronic participation rules for meetings of council committees and local boards for an additional six month period or until such a time that it is safe to resume in-person meetings in the council chambers. And the council not allow for proxy voting. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Lynn and Dan, thank you. Maureen, did you wanna comment? Yep. So just a bit of background on July 21st, 2020, Bill 197, the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act 2020 came into effect and provided changes to various pieces of legislating, legislation, including the Municipal Act. And in response to those legislative changes, council amended the procedure bylaw, allowing members of council and of local boards and committees to participate electronically in meetings until December 31st, 2020, as well as at that time, they suspended the regular advisory committee meetings until year end. At the time, staff also advised they would bring back further information by year end regarding proxy voting and electronic participation. Therefore, before council are the following recommendations. Number one, staff are proposing advisory committee meetings resume in February of 2021 via electronic participation. This will give staff time to contact the committee members and ensure they have the capability to participate electronically, as well as provide any necessary training uh, for those that are um, not uh, familiar with electronic meetings. Uh, number two, staff are proposing to extend electronic participation meeting rules through an amendment to the procedure bylaw. As the concern with the spread of COVID-19 continues throughout Ontario and the ability to resume in-person meetings with proper physical distancing and other safety measures in the council chambers is not yet uh, feasible. Therefore, staff is recommending that council consider extending participation through electronic means by all members of council for a further six month period or until such a time that it is safe to resume to in-person meetings. Uh, number three, that uh, council not allow for proxy voting. At the special meeting of August 24th, staff provided information to council on proxy voting. At that time, members agreed that proxy voting not be allowed. By virtue of this report, staff are confirming council's direction. However, should council feel differently, the clerk will conduct research and prepare a report with further details regarding proxy voting for consideration at a future meeting of council. There are a few options available uh, to council. You could uh, cancel all or a portion of advisory committee meetings for 2021. Uh, you could try to resume in-person meetings as of January 21st or January 1st, 2021. 
However, not recommended as council chambers cannot accommodate members of council staff and public in a safe manner. Uh, three, you could provide direction to the clerk to bring back a report where council meetings can take place, integrating members both electronically and physically. And four, uh, you could provide direction to the clerk to bring back a report providing council with a process for proxy voting. Okay. <clears throat> Comments, questions? Everybody's okay with that? So, oh, Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's to do with the uh, committee meetings. Um, if the committee members don't have access to a computer that's got the camera on it, then they're gonna come to the a facility to make sure it's uh, gonna go that way. So that would have to be council chambers, I would think, in case there's a closed session, which then compromises the town hall, which I don't like. So I'd be in favor of, uh, of uh, extending the committee absenteeism reports until uh, till June. Thank you. Okay. Any further comment? No, Lisa? Uh, I have to disagree on that one. I think it's important that we value the committees that we have set up and um, try to engage them and, until we know what access is like or what challenges we have. Um, I, I think most people nowadays, you know, have at least a computer where they can participate, even if without the video, then certainly, you know, um, with audio and committees are so small that we would be able to hear when someone has something to say, or we could have, you know, the, the raise hand option through Zoom as well is another option um, to have people who, who aren't visible do so. I, I, I think it's important that we respect the committees and see what we can do to bring them back in some form. Okay, anybody else? Any other comments? Okay. Uh, I, uh, I support the report. I think it's going to be at least the first quarter of this year is not going to be any different than 2020. And, you know, hopefully by the end of that quarter, Marine will be able to come back with some potential change to, uh, if things improve over the next three months. Okay. All in favor then? Okay. Thank you. Okay. A calendar of meetings, please. Receive and approve report 2012-1407 and the attached 2021 calendar of council and committee meetings. Move and seconder, please. Then Chris. So we have it. Any comments on the calendar? No. Okay. All in favor then? have to excuse me a little bit and on the tail end of this shingles thing and I'm having terrible head pains right now so I'll be a little bit off. Um, committee reports and minutes none, motion to motions none, county report Dan. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, four points. Uh, one, at tomorrow county meeting warden Diane Robinson will be sworn in as a 2021 warden followed by the striking committee to which we hope I'll be put on the operating and the development of property. Last Wednesday, uh, 09 December, at the Madawaska Bridge was officially opened by the mayor and the warden. It was on budget and on time, which included a street light with the pedestrian signals at the island. The county has received our request and report for the intersection of the Daniel and Edie streets that will be brought forward at the 2021 January operating meeting. And for all the snowmobile enthusiasts, the Algonquin Trail is open for snowmobile traffic from Greenwood to Greenside Street in Pembroke, which means you can get the Finnegan's Restaurant. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Any questions for Dan? They have snow in Pembroke, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been there, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> uh, correspondence peti uh, petitions, we have one report. That the correspondence package I-20, December 22, be received as information and filed accordingly. Mover and seconder, please. Dan, Tom, any comments? Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, a couple. 
On page three, Ontario announces 13 new health, Ontario health teams to go along with the 24 that are in place now. Of note, the county of Renfrew, which includes Armprior, is not part of any health team, although discussions are taking place at this time. On page 12, Ontario government has announced it is budgeted for 3,000 new and upgraded long-term care spaces. That's good news for half of council. On page 31, the Ontario is being a leader in requiring our car gas to be more cleaner and greener by means of 15% more renewable content. So not only with that carbon stuff that's coming down the thing, get ready for an increase in price at the pumps. At least you'll know why we're greener and meaner. On page 62, 2021, the Ontario Community Infrastructure set, we've done that. Uh, is set at $571,467, provided we meet the terms and conditions of the agreement. That was the key the, that were in approval. So to the general manager of finance, have we met the terms and conditions to get this funding? Um, we have. We entered into a contribution agreement in 2016 uh, with the province for this uh, OSA funding. So every year when they proceed with giving us our allocation notice for the next year, it actually forms part of that 2016 agreement that we have with the with the province. So we're good. We're good. Thank you. And on page 119 of interest, there is a webinar through the AMO Whitby to watch that explains critical principles should embrace to help employees protect and improve their mental health post COVID-19 to the CEO, has uh, staff reviewed this webinar to see if it's beneficial to our staff? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, County Councilor Lynch for that question. We have um, not had a chance to review the webinar. We, we intend to do so, and we will share that link with our staff. I should note that the town has an employee assistance program, and we have regularly sent out documents through our uh, human resource officer, for example, uh, well, wellness, well Wellness Wednesdays and that kind of thing. And they've contained some really good information to assist with mental health during this difficult time. So uh, we hope that we're doing enough for our staff. Thank you. That's it, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No, all in favor then, please. Carried, thank you. It's number 15, there are bylaws. Are we doing them all at once, pulling one out? Uh, Lynn was first and then Lisa. So if we can pull the first one out, please, Mr. Mayor. I'm sure that there is going to be some discussion on that one. Okay, so we'll do them all except number one then first. Okay. That the following bylaws be and are hereby enacted and passed. Bylaw 711420, enter into agreement with Julietta Holdings Fairground Subdivision. Bylaw 711520, annual health and safety statement. Bylaw 711620, lease agreement with the County of Renfrew Water Tower. 711720 lease agreement with Storm Internet Water Tower, 711820 extension of electronic participations at meetings, and 711910 appoint W. Hunter, Integrity Commissioner, close meeting investigator until 2024. Okay, mover seconder, please. Lisa, Lynn, any further comments on those? None. All in favor then? Carried, thank you. So then number one. That the following bylaw be and is hereby enacted and passed. Bylaw 710820, adopt council code of conduct. Move and seconder, please. Dan. Seconder. To get it on the table, Mr. Mayor, so we can discuss it. I need a seconder to do that. Chris. Okay. So then uh, discussion. Lynn. So if you can afford me a few minutes, because I have several questions and comments, if I could have some leeway, please. Um, so first off, section 3.3, .3, uh, question for Maureen. It reads, as per section 2261C of the Municipal Act. So I just want to clarify that, therefore, that this is a directive of the Municipal Act, the bylaw that we uphold, that the mayor is the primary spokesperson for council. Is that correct, Maureen? So if I could just say a little blurb before uh, heading into this as well. Um, 
Armpar is not unique. <laughs> As in most municipalities, the mayor is the ceremonial and spokesperson for the municipality. Concern has been expressed by a number of residents that other members of council are effectively being muzzled with the proposed amendment to the council code of conduct. Staff appreciates the public in reaching out with their concerns as members of council are elected on their ability to give voice in opposition or support on issues in the community. Therefore, the intent of the amendment to the code is not to stifle members of council as members of council have always and will always have the right to speak their minds. The intent of the amendment was to recognize that social media exists. Whether personally or in social media, members of council have always and will always continue to be able to respond to the public, advise how they voted and defend how they voted on a matter, as well as respectfully recognize the right of other members of council on how they voted. It is only when a matter is decided by resolution of council that all members should support the resolution or action being taken and therefore not seek to undermine public trust and confidence in council as a whole. So council has the ability to consider the proposed amendments um, or refer back to staff with further feedback. I know Councillor Grinstead, you probably have some more comments, <laughs> but that is um, my comment on the um, the public comments that were received this weekend. Okay, so you, if I can further go, I still have a few more. So you've just pretty much answered my comment on section 3.3 and section 10. The, the whole intent um, is not to stifle council. Council, um, you know, in section 10 in CNG, it states that you know, council can have their opinion, but they have to state that it's their opinion. Um, basically, Section 10, because uh, we all got emails, we all got calls, we all got everything. Basically, Section 10 is just telling us to play nice in the sandbox. That, that once a decision is made, you can't sling mud at your other fellow councillors. That once a decision is made, we, we, do, we do adhere to this... Um, uh, council of a whole and if, if you're if the vote has gone one way or the other whether it was the way you voted or not you're not to then you know sling mud at, at the other ones but we are allowed to voice our opinions as our opinions we are allowed to be the voice of residents if residents come to us individually we're allowed to put that forth to the proper department at town hall with the cao and get help them to get their issues resolved so we're not being stifled it's just an act and it, it's really sad that that life has come to this but this is the way things have come over the last few years is that you have to have all of these policies in because everyone's feelings are getting hurt about things and we and we have to be take, taking care of what we're saying in the general public so that's enough of that because you answer all of mine with your statement thank you maureen but i do have another <laughs> comment on section 11. that's fine okay so section 11 uh I can't support this, this bylaw just based on section 11, because for the past 30 years, I have been on so many different boards and so many different committees. I've personally organized fundraisers and have been in fundraisers to, to raise funds for so many different organizations and uh, nonprofits. And I feel that this is in fact, uh, is being added, uh, to, to this code of conduct, the, this, this, um, this section, because all politicians are being painted with the same brush as some of the very few, because if you look at it, there's few politicians that are corrupt. And therefore, now we have this, this uh, section in this code of conduct being put in there to basically save everybody's butt in, for those odd ones that are corrupt. But this is small town arm prior. And I have to say that 10 years ago, 11 years ago, whenever it was that I was first elected, I was elected based on the fact that people knew who I was because of the amount of stuff I did in the community. Council is just the next step for me. It, it was, it was 
to me, a bigger board to sit on, to, to help push Arm Prior forward and to help Arm Prior grow uh, for the betterment of everybody. To, to tell us that we can't fundraise and we can't be on committees and we can't do these things, um, then I, I just, you're, you're, you're removing the very fiber of who I am. Um, and I just, I, I cannot, I cannot support that. I just, we are not all corrupt. We, we all do what we do because we love our communities and we love the organizations within our communities. Absolutely. And, you know, as confirmed with the Integrity Commissioner, Section 11C allows members of council to support charitable causes as long as they do so in their private capacity. It does become questionable if a member of council solicits funds for charity while representing himself or herself as a member of council. And it's up to the member to choose whether to participate in charitable causes or not and in what capacity. However, whether this is included in the, in the um, code or not, if someone feels that a member of council has a pecuniary interest, they can apply to the integrity commissioner or to the courts. So whether it's included in the, in, in the code or not, that can still happen. Um, it is an obligation of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act to ensure that that council is just following that act. But again, it's up to members of council to decide how they want to uh, belong to charitable organizations. Um, and again, if they have any questions about it, contact the integrity commissioner. That is what the integrity commissioner is there for. He's there to advise council on all of these issues. Okay, you were ready for me. I was. <laughs> Okay, so what you're telling me is if next year they had another uh, sleep out for the homeless and I raised money for the homeless as Lynn Grinstead, a concerned citizen of Armprior, that that should be okay. But Absolutely. if somebody <laughs> felt that they wanted to ruffle some feathers, they can go and make a complaint on me. Absolutely. Hey, can I interject a thought into this dialogue? And I know Lisa, you're up next. But, uh, I've had a lot of conversation about this one because I'm with you too. And, and as I said the last time, and I think the point here is to understand it's not going to change my behavior from what I read, but I need to understand that there is a risk factor out there that if somebody files a complaint, I'm going to have to defend that in some nature. So as a member of council, even though I want to act personally in my own community, and I do that, someone could still file the complaint and I still would have to defend my position. And I think that's what's important for council to know. Can I just further the that? risk factor, how much, I don't know. Yeah. So Maureen, for instance, years ago, we used to have the jail or bail mm -hmm. and mayors across the province, you know, or in this county, at least I know for sure, mayors would be called upon to be put in jail because they would raise the most money. So you're telling me that we can't use that position to help them to raise more money? Not necessarily. I'm saying that you're throwing caution to the wind by doing so, simply because you as a council member have influence in the community and people are going to you're they may respond differently to you and again when you're collecting money um you have to make sure you're collecting it no one is no one is saying that you're not collecting it on the up and up but you have to be wary of that yeah i think the you know the issue again is uh you know, I did that jail and bail for years and I know I was asked because I could raise that thousand dollars every year for them fairly quickly. So, you know, like I said in the discussion earlier this week, I would probably, I not probably would do the same thing again, but I'd say to somebody, take your envelope and give it to Joe, you know, and not give it to me. But, you know, uh, I'll have somebody drop by and pick up your check. Thanks a lot. You know, the influence may be there, may not be there. I can't, separate myself in someone's mind from one one position or another. If 
but you know, uh, I'm, you know, thinking about this all week, I'm definitely confident that asked I'm going to uh, support uh, fundraising events in the community may do it a little differently, may take a, like I said, some steps and not, not have that, those funds that actually come into my hand, but I'm not likely to step away from that opportunity. Just Chris. Yeah, just one, I'll just like, uh, on the same, like uh, the last time this was brought, I mean, I was against it as well, but uh, after reading the memo, um, Maureen, you know what, I feel a lot more comfortable, you know, continuing to do what I do. Um, so I think the memo was fantastic and it did kind of, you know, shed some light. Um, so I'm okay with it now. And it was all because of the memo that you did send out. Uh, just kind of letting me know that, you know what, there are some risks, but, um, you know, I'm willing to take those risks because, I mean, it's, I'm okay with how it sits now. So... Okay, so I have to go to Lisa. She was patiently waiting for me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, um, so starting back um, with media communications. Um, I think the intention, the challenge I have with it is that our previous, our current bylaw that we have now mentions um, it reads, uh, it's understood, mayor's head of council, primary spokesperson, and there's a, a section that says, which does not prohibit other members of council. That's been removed. By having that removed, it suggests that it does prohibit other members of council. And certainly with what, <clears throat> what we went through a couple of weeks ago, when we were asked for comment by a local member of the media, and we were immediately um, reminded that the mayor is our spokesperson and we were, we were asked for comment. We weren't um, asked to, to share a position of the town or whatnot. I, I hesitate to support that part of things. Um, I certainly support the mayor's role as our spokesperson. And, um, you know, I think the, the intent of it, uh, you know, letters to the mayor from council, uh, the proclamations, certainly, you know, the awards that, uh, that happen and, um, I, I, I can easily support that as we always have, but I'm not sure that I'm seeing the problem that pre-existed in our current media communications 3.3 that needed to be fixed by removing, which does not prohibit other members of council, especially when that lines up to recent reminders not to comment or, or speak to the media. Um, so that's, that's my issue with that. Similarly, when you look at social media, it's, it's almost a, a duplicate of, of that because it's a reminder that the mayor is our spokesperson. Um, you know, we, um, you know, and, and I will say, I feel a little bit better about it now than when I first spoke with Maureen on this, however many millions of times that we've spoken on it. Um, because, you know, I said, well, what about this? And what about that? And it, it seemed very, very restrictive and, and concerning. I still though, um, I, I, I still, I can't support putting it in there because it, we have an accountability and transparency policy. And that says that part of our good governance includes encouraging and facilitating public access to information and that accountability, transparency and openness are standards of good government that enhance public trust. So anything that attempts to remove those opportunities for members of council um, is not, we're, we're not moving forward. Um, it, we're, we're taking some giant steps back and it, it concerns me that um, it, as encouraging as what was just expressed could potentially be, reading the policy as it is could put us in conflict simply by sharing information in, in certain ways. So I, I can't support um, the changes to the media communications or social media. I'm, I'm, I apologize, I, I just can't. Um, and Lynn, you're asking, you, you know, um, section 2, 226.1C, um, what that does say is that the mayor is the, pri it doesn't say the mayor is the primary spokesperson. It says that the mayor acts as the representative of the municipality, both within and, with, and outside of the municipality. Um, there's, there's, there's nuance, there's a difference there. Um, so 
I, I have issue with those two. Um, I think, you know, and we've heard from, from residents who have also had concerns about it. Encouraging transparency should be the direction that we're going in. And this, this does take us a bit of a step back again, especially if we're removing that part that said, which does not prohibit council members. Some of the other codes for other municipalities that I've looked at, um, there's almost a, there's a natural assumption that council, it's when members speak to um, the media or the public, it, that there's an assumption in their code that in the, there will be communications between council members and the general public. And I, I'd like to see something that provides more of that understanding for us. Um, and then again, back to the whole uh, improper use of influence and, and the charities. I understand what you're saying. And, and like Lynn, I feel a lot better about what has been explained. But again, the way that it's written, we're almost outside of compliance just by engaging in charitable ads rather than and I understand we're talking semantics at this point in time, but if we don't include 11C, we're not automatically breaking the code, even though our behavior might not change. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm being clear on that one. So that's, that's, so based on all of that, I, I cannot support this. I would, um, I'd support maintaining status quo, which was one of our options, is one of our options. I'm not sure what the problem is with the 2013 bylaw that we're trying to fix because it is in compliance with provincial regulations and um, it, it, you know, it has worked for us. I'd like to see it keep working for us. Thanks. Hey, uh, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, just unmuting. A uh, couple of quick comments. One, I concur that you be the spokesperson for the town once we've made the decision. But as you know, when Billy Bob calls seven councillors to say that some dog is doing doo-doo on the neighbor's yard and who's going to respond? Seven of us march over to see where the dog is. I don't agree with that. And then we all have an opinion to the guy to see what we're going to do or didn't do. Then we have a fight on our hands between the four councillors because we didn't all have the same story. So this is where the mayor tells the story and we support it or we make our comment at the end. So that, that's that part on the 3.3. On the 11C, I uh, agreed, well, I guess Lynn changed her mind, but I was saying that we delete C up until the last paragraph where it says members shall remain arm's length for financial aspects of external events, which they support in the public capacity and shall not participate in decisions concerning the disbursement of the funds. So we're raising money for the poppy campaign. I wear my Legion uniform. I go sell poppies at uh, McDonald's or wherever. I turn the money in. I don't get a vote on where that who veteran or whatever gets, but I am a front and center guy to say I'm a, I'm a senior. I'm a veteran and I'm a town councillor, and that's who I want this town to remember me as. So uh, that's why I don't like the first part of C. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else for a comment? Ted? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my concern is with 3 3 and the removal of the words, which does not prohibit other members of council. What is the logic for suggesting the removal of those words? Tell you the truth, I'm sitting here wondering why I removed that. And it must have been in my references. Um, I must have been looking at something and, and to be perfectly honest at this moment, I cannot tell you why I did that. So I think what might be best is I wouldn't want to see council um, taking things in, taking things out on the floor. It might be best if I bring it back uh, for another meeting if council wants that. Um, I could come back with an explanation as to why I removed that, uh, uh, Councillor McGee. Um, my intent was certainly just that, uh, as in the media communications, that council, it mirror the social media part of it, that the mayor is the primary spokesperson for council. Um, but certainly didn't intend to um, in any way limit council, other members of council not speaking. 
Well, I would be uh, satisfied with the bylaw if those words were put back in. So if, you're gonna, if we're going to pull it for review for the next meeting, then I would like to see them included. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't have an issue with being back in, but I have uh, another thought to leave with you. If we're going to bring it back. I think it's a good thing. I think there needs to be a control point, like the example last week, where there is serious risk of potential legal issues and that, and that there has to be some kind of intervention before, because what happens is that in, in, at a point in time, council may not be aware of all the details. And that was, you know, part of the situation last week. And as you know, after the memo you got, that was our concern there was that we not, people don't get themselves in trouble legally by saying something that they haven't been, uh, they haven't been into uh, in discussion with the balance of council and staff to, to be aware of. And I think they need to be aware of that first. So I'm not, I'm not sure just how to suggest that protection for everybody, but, but I think it's a, as important as, as adding the other back in. Lisa, yeah. Um, I, Mr. Mayor, um, a suggestion. Um, if the intention of the bylaw, which I think I'm hearing and understanding correctly, is that things that are created and decided by council as a whole or um, scripted in cooperation with staff fall into the rule, you know, the role of mayor, then that would be basically where mayor spokesperson falls in. And things that are our opinion or something that, um, you know, we're looking to, sh to share with the community or engage the community in where it's not, maybe, maybe that's the line that we could draw on those ones. Yeah, I don't think the intent is to muzzle anybody in their opinions. It's just to be careful that we don't, you know, uh, uh, get into enhanced legal situations over some situations too. And that needs to be considered in this process, I think as well too. And may not, if it hadn't been, you know, a particular time, that particular incident, we may not have, have, have had the sensitivity to that uh, concern. If I may. Tom, sorry. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Uh, no, I, I tend to agree. However, there are, there are individuals throughout this municipality that may not like Tom Burnett. They may not like uh, Mayor Stack or they may not like... Uh, uh, Ted Strike, but they may want to go to Councillor Lynch or one of the other councillors. So I think we we should definitely have some freedom to be able to voice our opinions. So let's. I think what Maureen's asking for, and again the consensus is, let her take her back and reconsider those two points and bring it back to us in the new year. Is that satisfactory? Yeah. Okay. Do you? Need a motion for that, Maureen, or are you just, just a motion to continue yeah. to defer it? Okay, so I saw Tom's hand up first, and then Lisa. So all in favor with that? Okay, thank you, Carrie. Good, thanks. Good discussion. Um, resolution next, please. McNabb Rayside Rec. Where is the Corporation of the Town of Armfair and the Township of McNabb Rayside jointly entered into a recreation center use agreement on June 9, 2015? And whereas under clause 3.2, the recreation center use agreement is automatically extended for a further five year period to a maximum of three such extensions. And whereas the municipal recreation committee composed of both Armpire and McNabb Brayside representatives met on November 24th, 2020 to discuss the 2020 and 2021 grants. And whereas the municipal recreation committee recommends the following, that the 2020 McNabb Brayside recreation grant be adjusted from $224,333 to $143,665 to reflect the 2020 recreation facility closure due to COVID-19. And that the five-year methodology review outlined in section 5.1.4 of the Recreation Center Use Agreement be deferred to 2021. And that the 2021 McNabb Brayside Recreation Grant be tentatively set at $226,576 20 grant value plus 1% cap for budget purposes subject to any further facility closures and the deferred methodology review. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Dan and Lynn, comments? All in favor? Oh, is that a comment, Lynn? Or? Yeah, okay. I just, uh, obviously, I just want to confirm that this number, um, 
the the board uh, the the committee uh, looked at all of the numbers with uh, with uh, Jennifer, and this is a number that was um, well established and not just estimated. No, Jennifer did the number crunching for us. Want to speak to that, Jennifer? Uh, yes, I, um, great question, um, Councillor Grinstead. I did crunch it based on our actuals up to the end of October 30th, um, and it includes that five-month window of time, plus I put in some of the base costs that the Town of Ron Power were experiencing at the time during COVID, so McNabb Brayside will be shipping in a, a piece of that, so that's what that number represents. Okay, I just wanted to make sure for public, public sake. Thank you. Okay. Chris? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, uh, Jennifer, is the reduction in that uh, amount of money that we will be uh, getting, was that captured in your COVID financial update? Yes, it was. So throughout the, the months, I always estimated um, as the time went on, as the closures grew, I, I kept estimating um, uh, an amount for, to, for the McNabb Race Agreement in case it did get reduced. So I already had that built into those calculations. So the COVID numbers you saw has it built into it. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. All right then. Yeah. All in favor then, please. It's carried. Thank you. Okay. Next is announcements, and I am going to uh, jump in ahead of Dan tonight. Look at the smile on his face. A number <laughs> of things I, I do certainly want to, and even though we've done our video internally for staff and and council. I want to take this opportunity to wish everybody uh, a very Merry Christmas and all the best in, in 21. I hope that it's a different year than 2020, certainly at some point, and that things uh, at least begin to loosen up and become a little bit more normalized. I know we're all, we're all uh, feeling a bit of COVID fatigue, uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's been a real... Uh, a uh, piece of satisfaction, I guess, I want to say to watch Amper over this last nine months, the behavior in town, the way people have, you know, helped each other, the wearing of masks, the social distancing, and the consideration through, uh, through a very difficult time. Uh, I am concerned, and I have been saying all, all through the time, I've watched the numbers, Brantford County is making me a little nervous at this point, you know, uh, Six and a half weeks ago, we were at 53, we're at 203 or something today. So, you know, we need to, and we know there, there are some specific incidents that happen there, but we're also coming into the Christmas season and, and uh, we, need to, we need to be diligent and, and stay, uh, stay careful. So all the best to everyone out there and to uh, you and to council. Thank you very much for your hard work and support this year is much appreciated. I also want to recognize as one of the famous elves there a week ago, Sunday, uh, Mayor Peckett and I were at the Nick Smith Center. And I want to recognize Teresa Karen and her team for that drive through Santa Claus uh, uh, parade. And uh, it went really well. It was extremely well attended. I don't know how many vehicles went through, but I know my, my wife said she came through and it took her an hour and 40 minutes to get through the process just uh, to, uh, to see how it was going. Uh, they had a trailer for the food bank, packed it solid with food, raised over $1,000 in cash. And it was really, uh, Mayor Peckett and I, as the elves got to hand out the candy, so it was really something to see the, the kids. And there were some big kids uh, came through for candy, eh, Tom? And, uh, you know, it was a real success. <laughs> uh, the other thing I want to recognize is, uh, is uh, before our next meeting, Jen... Kochescu will be leaving us uh, from HR. She's moving on to another opportunity. I spoke with her this week and we want to wish her well and all the best in her, her new endeavors and in the new year. And Robin did do it already, but I did have it noted here, Robin, to welcome our new planner who, uh, who came in today. And uh, I, uh, uh, Robin introduced you this morning and I went by her office at noon hour and she was sitting there having lunch. So I told her that was a good sign looked like she was staying for the afternoon anyway. So glad to have her aboard. So the last one is, uh, I have some comments I wanna make on the, on, the, on the racism issue. And uh, for council's benefit, I have put hours and hours and hours and hours of thought into this process. And uh, this is, 
my, you know, my, my thoughts on it and discussions with staff. But anyway, here it is. They said, over the past week, I've read the accounts that have been put forward and people's opinion on this issue and given them serious thought. Further, I respect the right for each and every one of us to do so, and each opinion needs full consideration. I've also reached out to contacts with experience in this issue for some input and direction going forward. Also, staff have put time and energy into what things we could do to improve our, our role as a municipality as it relates to this very serious concern. And I didn't want an off-the-cuff reaction. Here's what we can do uh, just to get an answer out there within 24 hours. We spent an, uh, all week trying to come up with, with what we think is a solid beginning plan. Uh, so we've reviewed the input and have four ideas to put to council tonight. And my hope is council will move and support a motion to move forward on these actions. First, we wanted to further research the opportunities for formal training and education for council and staff on diversity and inclusion. This will help us to be more aware and focused on, the race, on racism in our own community. Second, I've asked the CEO to take actions to establish information centers on the topic of racism and inclusion at the Nick Smith Center, the library, perhaps town hall and other areas that that may be benefit uh, and be uh, convenient for people in our community to, uh, to get that information. Third, a commitment by the organization to do a complete review of all policies to ensure that they appropriately state, to, uh, state it to in ensure inclus inclusivity and results in actions to demonstrate the same. So we'll look at all of our policies over the next months to, uh, to review them and, and that. Second thing is to establish a round table with council staff and community members who could have an opportunity to bring forward their experiences on thoughts on how to move forward. To identify our areas of weakness and our areas we can build on. Further, I would suggest that staff look into a qualified experience facilitator to lead that round table and help uh, add value to the results. Now, my closing comments are, and they are mine, not council's. Council can comment on, uh, on their own is that we have a lot of work ahead of us, but working together, we can make significant progress in our community. And all the years that I've been in municipal government, I've always answered questions honestly, based on the knowledge and information I had at the time. I did so in this case as well with CBC, when they asked if I thought racism was systemic in our empire. While going through the process outlined, outlined above, will, the, will going through the process outlined above change my response? Very possible but again, will be based on knowledge and information that, that have provided facts and evidence. From my perspective, to say racism is systemic in Aaron Pryor because others say so, or by, the, by their definition, not mine, is something I'm not prepared to do. In my view, it would be stating that the town of Aaron Pryor is a racist community. Do we have problems with racism? Yes, unfortunately, for sure. How, do, is it, how widespread is it? I honestly don't know. I'm learning over this last 10 days more so than I thought. I truly hope that it's not, it has not become embedded in the heart and soul of our town. If it has, it is systemic. I hold out hope that we can intervene before it is. So thanks for listening and uh, my opinion on the thoughts. And I would like some discussion with council, hopefully uh, a motion to uh, move those four actions forward. Lynn? I would forward that motion, uh, Mr. Mayor, for you, that we uh, that we follow through with your with your suggestions outlined. Uh, there's some procedural issues. Yeah. I believe there's some procedural issues with that, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so generally, we wouldn't have a motion and announcements, but uh, if council would like to suspend the rules of procedure, um, they and that that requires a two third vote then you could go forward with a motion at that time. Okay. And that's an option we have tonight, or again, this issue yes. can be deferred and it will be held up till our first meeting in January. I'm just looking to get some action moving so ASAP, two, oh. sort of. Dan, sorry. Mayor, I'd, I'd prefer to have it deferred so we can put, I'll put some more input and maybe fine tune your, your, uh, your comment. Thank okay, you. so wait, I think, you know, Maureen, I got another procedural thing. Lynn has moved something, so we need to go back there? Uh, it hasn't been seconded yet, so. Okay, 
it's up to it's up to uh, members of council what they wish to do. Okay, uh, Lisa is up next. I think. Um, yeah, I think I think what Dan said is is actually um, important. I think it's important for us to give this um, some thought and to to review perhaps what it is that um, you're thinking. I think it's clear we can always do better. Um, you know, I'm 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 embarrassed at the person I used to be or the things I used to think and. Every day I learn and every day I'm committed to learn um, on the subject of racism in armed prior. Um, my personal view is that anywhere that it happens, it's too much and you know we do have a problem. And as leaders, as municipal leaders, we have a responsibility to do what we can and work together to, uh, to facilitate whatever change that we can. And, and my commitment is definitely there to make that happen as well. So. Um, I, I would like to see it deferred just so that we could have a chance to review the plan, maybe work together on, on tweaking it and, and go from there. I'm open and just, Jan, yeah. yeah. Just the other thing, Mr. Mayor, is because uh, you mentioned we're gonna do some training and videos and stuff, there's gonna be a cost to this to bring the, the staff and us together at the same time. So that's a budget item maybe that we're gonna have extra training. That's where you know, discussions to save what kind of depth and you mentioned you might bring a facilitator in so that's that's money as well this is can all be part of the uh the deferment please and thank you yeah the, robin and i spoke about that's definitely going to have some cost to it it would have to be uh you know a budgeted item but i you know my point was to try and get some research started on it so we can do it but i'm easy you know it is coming into christmas it's it's going to be a uh, a lull in things that happen. Uh, I'm kind of flexible. I want to do this right. Is there, Lisa? Actually, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor and Madam CAO, um, if you'd like, I'm, I'd be happy to actually send you some resources that um, I, I have from the past, and they're uh, they're specific to municipalities. They're anti-racism and anti-discrimination for municipalities introductory manual, basically the work, it's a step-by-step. -step. It's, um, you know, you can take it, use what you can, throw away the rest, um, but it, it, it's it's a great resource. So there's a resource. Robin has found some as well. I reached out to the OPP and found what they use and I gave that to, to Robin as well as follow up for, for information, so. So um, Mr. Mayor, if I could, I think yeah. uh, there's no need to probably defer this. I think it could come back to a motion on the floor of council at the next, uh, at the next council meeting. 11th meeting. That's fine by me, as long as there's a direction before we shut down here at Christmas, you know? Okay, everybody's fine with that? Okay, so then Dan, you have announcements? Well, one through six are gone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> There's a Miss Lamb from Packenham who won the Lions Chase the Ace. So it's over until uh, 2021. However, the hospital is still up and running. So get your tickets before Christmas. The draw is tomorrow night at six o'clock. And in closing, uh, you know, like everyone else, Merry Christmas, uh, all that good stuff to our residents. And uh, stay safe. We're at 16 uh, as of today. Let's keep that until uh, March when the needles get here. Thank you. Hey, Lynn. So I just have two congratulation announcements. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate TAP, uh, Teachers Against Poverty. They had their tree auction and contest that was all closed up uh, on Friday. I did try to get some numbers to help to uh, to relay those to council and, and the residents, but I didn't hear back from them. But I know that they had great response uh, to all of their activities to the point where even with their donations, they exceeded what they thought they were going to they like the help that they were going to get, that they opened up n new avenues for people because people wanted to help more and more. I'm sure Maureen probably could speak to that more, but I just, congratulations to all of them. They did uh, an, an awesome amount of work and uh, very, very proud uh, to be in a community that is so giving. Um, also on the same, on the same um, stream is Mike and the OPP had their toy drive last weekend as well. And, and I understand that it was a huge success as well. So just uh, awesome to be in a community that is so giving and uh, considerate to, to all. Okay, anyone else? 
What you bring to mind, Olin, is the OPP auxiliary have been out the last couple of weeks as well, too, this past weekend at Metro and I think a week or so before at Giant Tiger, you know, uh, uh, supporting the food bank as well. So that's... Uh, so we were at Giant Tiger annual... Boy Drive and they're at, uh, yeah. at the Metro this past weekend for a food drive. Yes. Okay, Dan. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. One other one that just happened to notice, Christmas dinner. 24th of December for the people that are shut-ins. It's a drive-through only. Uh, you have to make a phone call in order to get on the list and then someone's going to bring you your meal or you have to drive by to get it. But we are going to do the uh, the Christmas dinner for shut-ins. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that one up, Dan. I read about it in the paper this past week too. So. Okay. Uh, Kayla, do we have any media questions? I'm not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. We have no closed session. We need a confirmatory bylaw. That bylaw 712020 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the regular meeting of council held on December 14th, 2020 B and is hereby enacted and passed. Move and second here, please. Tom, Chris, all in favor? Carry. I need a motion to adjourn, please. Lynn and Lisa. Oh, Mr. Mayor, change it up. I don't want to change it for the last meeting of the year. Okay. All in favor? Carried.